My name is Emily Lamb, and I will be presenting the cases to the board for their review in today's public hearing. Members of the public, at this time, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones or other devices so that the board can hear the cases uninterrupted. For these public hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearings. In today's hearing, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the record. <coughs> At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board will hear those wishing to speak in support of the appeal. If the appeal has opposition, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. According to the BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for presentation if no opposition is present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow 10 minutes for each side to present their testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of that allotted 10 minutes. <clears throat> At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on that case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, Section 1740-180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the metropolitan government. The zoning code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1st, 1998. <coughs> I will introduce the entire zoning code and make it a part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for Metro Nashville Network, it's imperative that anyone addressing the board please come forward, sit at the table, and speak at the microphone. All speakers should identify themselves by name and address and then make their desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish a quorum. The Code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present, but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing will be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you applied. A permit must be attained, obtained within two years for a board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could later be revoked at a, um, at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. I do have some preliminary announcements regarding cases that have been deferred and withdrawn. Case 2019-001 has been deferred to March 7, Case 2019-003 has been deferred to March 21st. Case 2... 003? 033. Oh, 33, okay. Case 2019-076 has been deferred indefinitely. And then on our short-term rental docket, case 2019-012 has been deferred to March 7th. 2019-031 also deferred to March 7th. 2019-014, and 039 have all been withdrawn. Short-term rental, sure. 2019-012 was deferred to March 7th. 2019-014 and 015 were withdrawn. 2019-031 was deferred to March 7th. And 2019-039 has been withdrawn. Okay, very good. Uh, and then I have one more deferral, case 2019-058. This is back on the other docket, not the short-term docket. Deferred one meeting to March 7th. Okay. Very Ready? Good. 
For members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meeting. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the requested action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, then the case is recommended to the board for their approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to the, a case that I call out identified for consent, please raise your hand, make sure I see you. We'll remove it from the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, these are the cases that have been recommended for the consent agenda. First, case 2019-045, involving property at 2032 Overhill Drive. Is there anyone here in opposition to that case, case uh, 2019-045? Seeing none, next case is 2019-055, involving property at 305 Arrington Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2019-055? Yes, so we'll pull that off from the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. Case 2019-063, uh, property at 3910 Kaler Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 63? <clears throat> case 2019-064, involving property at 607 and 609 North 2nd Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to that case, 2019-064? Case 2019-067, involving property at 995 Davidson Drive. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 067? Case 2019-069, involving property at 2225A, 24th Avenue North. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 69? Seeing none, next case is 2019-073, involving property at 3833 Dr. Walter S. David Boulevard. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 73? Case 2019-075, involving property at 815 Main Street. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 075? Seeing none, to review, Mr. Chairman, the cases uh, recommended for the consent agenda are 2019-045, 2019-064, 2019-065, Two thousand nineteen zero six seven, two thousand nineteen zero six nine, two thousand nineteen zero seven three, and two thousand nineteen zero seven five. Okay, those cases have been properly moved to the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Okay. None. Okay. All those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Four to nothing. Members of the public, if your case was just approved on the consent agenda, you're free to go, although you're welcome to stay for the remainder of the meeting. Or Please. you're welcome to watch it on the Metro Nashville Network at home or online. These meetings are cataloged online, so um, there's a YouTube channel you could watch, I think, nine years of BZA meetings. Um, so for those of you leaving, watch please, our friends at the Metro Nashville Network, please. For those of you leaving, please give our staff until Monday to get all the documentation and paperwork processed before you come to pick up your permit. Okay. Um, Ms. Lamb, let's get started. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have not seen any elected officials here. Um, so we can, if we see them, we'll call on them as they get here. Um, and we're ready to start. I will say the first uh, item on the docket is the motion to rehear case 2018-656. Council Lady Murphy has notified the board that she will not be able to appear here until about 2.30. So uh, with the board's permission, she's requested that that be pushed until she can hear to speak okay. on that. We'll take it up when she walks in. Mr. Chairman, the first case for the consideration by the board today is case 2019-020 involving property at 943 to 947 Woodland Street. Is the appellant here on this case? If you'll come forward. Case number 020, please come forward. Zoning map here shows the zoning of the property as CS. 
This is the aerial photo. <coughs> excuse me, aerial photo showing you the surrounding area. Before you now is a proposed site plan for the project. And finally, photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. This request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements in order to renovate a commercial property without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2019-020? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make your presentation to the board. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address before speaking. Thank you very much. My name is, and uh, also thank you to the board. I appreciate your time and your service on this behalf. Uh, my name is Clint Camp with WNA Engineering here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm the civil engineer for the project. Uh, we respectfully request on behalf of our client, Green Little, uh, to allow us to replace the existing sidewalk uh, to the new Metro Public Works standard details across the section fronting Woodland Street. Um, well, first of all, that's not a sidewalk, it's just one giant curb cut, right? There are three parcels on this site. Uh, the, with uh, three curb cuts across that access for each parcel, yes oh, So up near the top, that is part of a real sidewalk? It, it, there is a transition between curb cuts uh, for a small portion. But it doesn't look like a big drop off like a normal sidewalk would be, so it looks like people might just kind of drive over that and come in? The current standard is the, a majority of the area acts as a, as a curb cut, yes sir. Okay, continue. So uh, as we mentioned, uh, the project is uh, comprised of three uh, zero lot line buildings across three separate parcels uh, with each its own distinct curb cut uh, that fronting 943, 945, and 947 Woodland Street. Uh, we are requesting within our ability to renovate the existing uh, in order to uh, replace to that standard detail. Uh, I'd like to recognize that uh, the letter of opposition that we have from the adjacent property owner, Mr. F Mr. Hearn with Phillips Printing, we have, uh, there was a misunderstanding within the scope of work for this project and uh, he has written a letter on behalf of the improvements and with no objection for this project. I uh, would also like to note uh, for the record, uh, Council Member Withers uh, email of support that came out earlier today, uh, he regretfully mentioned that he was unable to attend the meeting. Um, so he supports this variance? He, he does support the variance, and I'd like to very, very briefly read the portion of the email that's applicable to this specific project. Sure, we'd love to hear it. Uh, on, for the record, uh, case 2019-020 for property located at 943, 947 Woodland. I support the applicant's appeal. During the last meeting, the staff recommendation had been for disapproval, and I asked the applicants to defer the item one meeting and meet again with staff. That meeting took place last week. I understand that the staff recommendation is still for disapproval, but an alternative design has been discussed. The alternative design would reduce the number of parking spaces along the Woodland Street frontage, and lack or a shortage of parking on Woodland Street has been an ongoing point of contention with neighboring residents and businesses. I've been consistent in supporting sidewalk repair replacements for commercial building renovation projects, but requiring new sidewalks to current standards for demolition, new construction projects. I recently supported, and this body granted, a similar appeal at another property being renovated on the same block to keep existing pull-in parking along Woodland, but to repair and replace existing sidewalk segments. I definitely understand the staff's reasons for recommending an alternative design that limits vehicle entrances to two curb cuts. However, I do not find the applicant's proposal to keep all of the parking spaces in front changes anything for current pedestrian conditions in front of this building being prepped for renovation. On the other hand, the applicant's proposal does replace crumbling sidewalk and apron sections, which is still quite costly and will improve conditions and trip hazards. So in this case, I wish to honor the neighboring resident and business owner feedback about parking conditions in the Five Points area, and I do support the applicant's request to repair and replace the existing sidewalks in this commercial renovation case. Well, um, would you pay into the fund then? It, it's my understanding that we're not eligible to pay into the fund based on the location of the project. Mr. Chairman, according to the ordinance, they're not eligible to pay into the fund, but this board has the authority to grant that as the condition of the variance. Okay. If, you were, if this board deemed that you were eligible to pay into the fund, would you pay into the fund if you got this variance? I think that's a reasonable alternative. Okay. Um, continue. You have got a minute left. I think that's uh, the remainder of our presentation in terms of the, the concept and the scope. If you look at the site plan, we sure. currently show 26 parking spaces. Uh, the alternative design is proposed and, and recommended by planning reduces uh, by six spaces with current right-of-way 
And should the uh, six foot right away donation occur as a potential option for donation? What do you mean six feet, not the whole frontage? Is that all you're offering is six feet? The variance on the right of way uh, that is uh, to get us to the T4 MCA3 right of way cross section would need an additional six foot across the entire frontage of the project. What I would be considering and in paying into the fund is for the frontage of the project. Would you be agreeable to that? Uh, for the 150 foot of roadway frontage along Woodland Street? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Questions of the applicant? So this board used to actually oversee curb cuts, but for some reason we don't do that now. And of course, curb cut is this area that you kind of enter and exit a property. And I guess back in the 60s, they just put curb cuts in this area instead of sidewalks. But um, this is a, um, as the councilman said, that they would lose basically, I think, most of their parking if they just built sidewalks on the front and then you couldn't um, pull in to these businesses. So um, the applicant has said that they'd be willing to pay into the fund on the 150 foot frontage. What do we think? Any questions of the board, I mean of the applicant before we close the public hearing? Okay, anything else to add? Uh, I think the other, to, be, to clarify our, uh, our right of way situation, uh, the T4 MCA3 right of way would be um, a detail that would require a four foot grass strip, an eight foot sidewalk, and a two foot behind back of sidewalk. So you need a variance from that part, is that what you're saying? And that part is, that is, that is the variance that we're seeking for, for the, the condition that you see in the, uh, in the photos along okay. Woodland Street. Okay. Thanks. We're going to close public hearing discussion. You know, given the enthusiastic support of the council person who wrote a very specific letter to this site as opposed to just sidewalks in general, and parking is kind of at a premium now in this growing five points area, um, the applicant has said that they'd be willing to pay the 150 um, feet foot into the in lieu fund. And, you know, given that this is a long standing, and, and I guess they have also agreed to kind of you know, open up public here. You're going to fix up the curb cut a little? What are you going to do? The entirety of the sidewalk that fronts along Woodland Street will be replaced as part of construction. But it's to, going to, to be current. basically kind of a curb cut, though, what it is now, but you're going to fix that up. We'll fix it to um, Metro Public Works current standard details. Okay. Yes, sir. But that's your plan? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. Okay, close public hearing again. So, discussion. Okay. Well, if anyone doesn't have any discussion. I'll make a motion that we approve the variance on case 020 from the sidewalk requirements and that they do not have to build the sidewalks, but they have to pay into the, I mean, they, they are going to build the sidewalks as they have agreed upon today, and they're going to pay into the in lieu fund, so they will still keep their parking. Um, granting the variance because of this long established kind of parking in the council person's um, request that this remain in this area and that there's not any on street parking anywhere nearby. I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, Ms. Lamb, what's next? Next case for the board to consider is case 2019-032, involving property at 3711 Ezell Road. Is the appellant here on this particular case? Yes. If you please come forward to the front table. Um, board members, before you now, you have the zoning map showing you the zoning of this property is R10. Aerial photos showing you the surrounding areas. Proposed site plan for this property. And finally, the current uh, photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. This is a request for a variance from side setback requirements in order to build an addition on a single family residence. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2019-032? Seeing none, the appellant, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation for the board. Please identify yourself by name and address. Hi, I'm Alexandra Alvarado and I will be speaking on behalf of my dad. 
Gilberto Alvarado. Our address is 37 to 11 Ezel Road. What was your first name again? Alexandra. Alexandra, okay, yes. very good. And like I said, I was gonna speak behind, behind him. Okay, so please get us started. Good. You can keep the microphone on, so okay. the Channel 3 people, if someone yeah. can okay. understand <laughs> what you're saying at home, it would be nice that they yeah. hear it too. Yeah, that's fine. I'm going to the project is for my children, because my house is small, and you are very big, and you need a better privacy. So uh, he's saying that his focus is on his family. Our house is not that big, and we have some additions to our family. We're not just... We only have three rooms, and we're a total of six people living in the house. So his main focus is, since we're older and I'm, I'm the oldest daughter, we need kind of like privacy. So he wants to build a little bit more space so everybody can have like their little own private. Have you talked to any of your neighbors, or does anybody uh, object to this? Uh, he actually went around the neighborhood and gave out the papers mm -hmm. and talked to one of them and they all said that they were that they were glad that he was trying to make more room for his kids. Okay. Why do you need to build out as opposed to back? Porque dice que quiere ser para para como para lado y no para atrás. Porque dice que puede es más enfrente quiero hacer también o sea incluir un garage para as if he builds to the back, it's going to be more difficult and the house is not going to be as together. As for him, he wants to also build a garage under the rooms that he's going to build in so he can put his stuff in there since he has, a, um, he has material for his work. Mm -hmm. So he wants to use that garage as to put his things, his tools in there as well. Any questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. Gracias. Okay, we're going to close public hearing. Discussion. Can you go back to the site plan? Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm assuming the, uh, the hardship would be the odd shape of the lot in topography. Do you have a motion or a question? Sure. Uh, I'll make a motion if you want. Uh, I move that we grant the variance uh, given the hardship of the odd shape of the lot and the topography of the site. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Pass. Oh, four to one. You got it. Very good. So good luck. Time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next case is case 2019-035 involving property at 59 Lincoln Street. Is the appellant here on this? Yes. All right. Um, this uh, particular request is for a variance from non-conforming lot size, setback, and sidewalk requirements in order to construct a single family residence on an undersized lot without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Before you now board, you see the zoning map showing the zoning of the properties R6. <coughs> Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding areas. Uh, before you now is a proposed site plan for this project. And finally, the photos showing you the current, proper, uh, current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 035? Seeing no opposition, the appellant will now have five minutes to make your presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Um, thank you for hearing me out today. My name is Andrew Buford, and the address is 59 Lincoln Street. Um, I have been, I came here last month. Um, and what I'm looking for is that with the current zoning, it uh, only allows for an 11 foot wide house. And so if I could get a variance on it, um, I could build a small, uh, cute house for a nice family to live in. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the history of the property. Um, it was taken back by the uh, tax in a tax lien, and it was not sold because nobody wanted to buy it because it was unusable. So this has been an unusable, unwanted lot. 
Um, and so. And how much did you pay for it? I paid one thousand dollars. One thousand dollars. Yes. Okay. Um, but if it's not worth anything, I lost a thousand. So, um, and I've also spent on a survey, an architect, and I have talked to builders. Um, so, if I can get a variance on the front and the back of the land, I should be able to buy, to build a small house. And also, the variance is the same as the lot in front of it. So I'm asking for the same kind of variance, which is uh, five feet, as the property in front of it. Um, and so, that's what I'm asking what you, for. Five feet. Yes, ma'am. Are Wait. there other pictures? I think I sent it. Um, where it would be, the, the proposed uh, envelope would be five feet from the oh, front and yeah. 10 feet from the back, whereas the current zoning is 20 feet from the front and 20 feet from the back. And so if I could get a little bit of a variance, um, I could build a nice house there. But you referenced the property in front. On yes. Which property are you talking about? It, if you uh, if you go back, I'm sorry, um, but it's it's the one that touches it. Um, it's in the photo on the bottom. It's it's right there on the right. It's behind the trash can. You can't really see it very well. Um, but it's uh, the address is 26 and 28 North Hill Street is the property in front of it right there. So they got variances for that front property. And so I'm asking for similar variances as that. And I also have a uh, architectural rendering of what the property will look like um, once it's completed. So we have an email from Colby Sledge, the council person for the 17th district. And he says, he opposes this. He says, unquote, a request for all kinds of variances and exceptions to build a sub on a substandard lot on Lincoln Street, substandard in parentheses, too small to build on, lots are throughout Chestnut Hill, Trimble Bottom, and I'm going to be asking planning and zoning for a more comprehensive approach to them rather than this piecemeal one. So you could build an 11 feet wide house, why not do that? Um, I I mean, that's not even, uh, I don't even know if that would be legal because it's uh, 10 feet by uh, 20 feet. So you're talking about a 200 square foot home. Well, isn't the council person right then? This is a substandard lot. And isn't that why you bought it? No one bought it in the tax sale and you were able to yes, buy a, a piece of real estate in Nashville for only $1,000, which is in District 17, which is kind of unheard of. Yes, uh, if it's too good to be true, as they say. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, if I had known that, I wouldn't have bought it. But if if uh, so, when I was, you bought it, you didn't know that. Hey, there's a reason why no one wants this, and you probably can't build a normal size house on this lot. I, I was told that the the overlay zoning, which is uh, allows for more variances, and so this area. Um, has been the, the, I was told that the overlay allows for more variances because they want more building in the area, um, from what I understood. So uh, this is my first time to ever come before a board. I didn't know what I didn't know. So to answer your question, I didn't know. Okay. Um, um, do you have anything else, else? Questions? Uh, I just... If I can't build on this, it's most likely going to go back to Metro and, and never be utilized and be a vacant lot for that will never be used. So I'm asking you to save it. Well, you have you did you actually talk to Mr. Sledge? I, I did email him. Yes. Um, okay. And he said that he wasn't the final decider and that y'all were the final decision. Well, that is correct. I'm just curious. I mean, you're acting like you're not going to keep the property. It may be that he has a plan. I, I don't know what's what's in his mind, but he he did not say he had a plan. Um, he just said that it's not for him to decide. I wish I had printed off the email. I'm sorry. That's okay. I mean, the email to us just says he's opposed. He's yeah. Opposed because of the size of the lot. 
Uh, okay, thank you. So in his email, he talks that you're asking for all kinds of variances. So let's talk about those. You want a lot size variance. You want a setback variance and also a sidewalk uh, variance. Uh, yes. And I, I would like to pay into the sidewalk fund if I could. So I changed my mind on that one. So, I'll, okay, the, so I'm now looking we're just for two variances and I should have, I'm sorry I didn't change that. Ms. Ms. Land. Yeah. I believe this property is eligible to pay into the okay, fund. Sure. Okay, so um, questions of the applicant? Okay, anything else to add? It's up to you, okay. so I We're give it up to you. <laughs> close the public hearing, discussion. So as I said, this was obviously a tax sale that was taken back and then nobody wanted it and he buys it for all of $1,000, which is still kind of shocking in this great changing neighborhood, but although, and that there's probably a reason why it only went for $1,000 because can't do a lot with it unless you get a bunch of variances. Mm -hmm. So what do you all think? I should know the answer to this. Well, what I think is I'm not inclined to agree, but if we, isn't he better situated if he defers or withdraws his application than if we deny his application? Is there a difference? Yes. Ms. I'm Lynn, sorry, we didn't hear the question. If, is he better off deferring or withdrawing this and seeing what happens with the neighborhood and Colby than being rejected if that was going to happen? Um, not knowing what's going to happen with the neighborhood, that's hard to say. Certainly, if he withdraws it, then he could, you know, refile it. So, if time. he he loses this case today, how long to, is it? That's the question. Six months. Six months. Okay. Uh, also, one point of clarification with respect to whether or not he's eligible to pay into the fund. Not having parcel view and viewer in front of me, I think it's eligible, but I'm not certain. So, okay. to the extent you'll want to allow him to pay sure. into the fund, it'd be cleaner to grant a variance with that condition, so that mm -hmm. if he's not eligible, you're giving him the variance. Okay. What do our board members think about this case? I feel like we've we've granted these variances before, uh, and you know, it's a very fairly obvious hardship is that the property is too small to build on, so there's no way it can ever be developed if, if there's not a variance. It's, it's a pretty I mean, high threshold. I mean, I agree with that, but he knew that going in, and that's why the price was $1,000. You know? Yeah, I don't know that I find that a hardship. Well, I'm, that's what we've used before. When, when we've granted these, that's, I'm just saying that's what we've used before. Oh. It's definitely a circumstance. I just think my thought, where we have a councilman who's saying he's got this problem throughout the district, I think we set ourselves up for having all of these come in to seek a variance. He did reference that we granted one before, and I'm not familiar with it, but I'm persuaded just by the fact that in this particular case, the councilman uh, would rather do something across the board with the sub subsized lots in his jurisdiction than do something piecemeal. So I feel persuaded by that. And you know, Trimble Bottom, which now people seem to call Wedgwood Houston, um, was kind of a poor neighborhood when it was developed and these small lots had modest houses or maybe even shacks on them way back when and now a different group of people have moved in and they're wanting to build, you know, bigger houses than what these plots were and that's why these plots were so small because they could be affordable and People lived modestly over there 100 years ago. So the question is, and I agree that, you know, is there going to be a better master plan? Because as the council person points out, this isn't the only kind of small lot over there that isn't developed. And there's going to be a lot of more of these in the future. What does the board want to do? Does anyone have a motion, a suggestion? We'll the ask after. is that if it's denied today, okay. then you've got to wait six months. I know yes. the public hearing is closed. But yeah, but that's the microphone. Oh, yeah. So, as I understand it, if it's denied today, then there cannot be an application for six months. Yes. The only clarification there for the board's benefit is it cannot be the same, substantially the same request within six months. And given the uniquely small 
shape of this lot. It necessarily has to be essentially the same request regarding sidewalks, lot size, and setbacks. So it would almost guaranteed be the same request, but that's the six week standard or six month standard. Okay, so what are you thinking? Sorry, what were my choices? I apologize. Your choices are to let us vote on it today, to defer it and basically talk to your council person who seems to want some sort of master plan on small lots here. But if we voted on it today and you were not successful, you couldn't reapply to us for another variance for six months. So um, that's door number one, two, or three. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is my first time to do this. Um, I, uh, I guess I should uh, delay or defer. Defer, yes, sir. Okay. And so, Ms. Lamb, is it better just to kind of have an indefinite deferral since we don't know when? Uh, Councilman Sledge will work with planning on this? Or? If he wants to give an indefinite for deferral, he can do that. Um, when it does come back up, when he wants to bring it back before the board, the issue would be that he needs to re-notice it. But other than that, he can just let us know whenever he's ready to come before the board. Okay. So basically, we will indefinitely defer it, and you can bring it back when you... Is this the... Oh. <laughs> Wasn't me. <laughs> it sort of sounded like a fire alarm, but... Okay, a test. Okay, does anyone have a motion to indefinitely defer this? I make a motion that we uh, indefinitely defer case number 2019043. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Sorry. Motion's been made and properly second. Any discussion? Did I say the wrong one? Yeah. I'm sorry, it's 035. 035, okay, so we'll fix that. 035. Second it over there. All those in favor of the deferral indefinitely signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Okay. Good luck. Work with your council person. Hopefully we'll see you. Thank you. Appreciate y'all's time. Ms. Lamb. Next case is case 2019-043 involving property at 1008 Second Avenue South is the appellant here on this particular case. Aziz Azharov. Mr. Chairman, the appellant is not here on this case. Okay, so we have a no-show, and then is this the first time they've no-showed? This is the first time they no-showed. Okay, board members, what do you want to do? Defer one meeting. Okay, there's a motion to defer it for one meeting, Second. and it's been seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. One meeting. Okay, Ms. Lamb. Mm -hmm. Next case is case 2019. My apologies, 2019-055 got pulled from consent. My mistake again, 2019-052 is the next case. Apologies. 2019-052 involving property at 3701 Park Avenue. Is the appellant here on this case? Okay, please come forward. Zoning map here uh, shows you the zoning of the property is RS5. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Site plan for the proposed project here. And finally, photos showing you the current conditions of the property. This is a request for a special exception to construct an addition to an existing church on a non-conforming structure. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2019-052? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make your presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Thank you, board members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is David Abbey with Development Management Group here on behalf of the owner Spiro Day Church. Okay, before we get started, how was your meeting in your neighborhood meeting? Meetings went well. We've actually had two meetings. Okay. Um, we had one back um, about three weeks ago or so, I think, where there were five of the neighbor, uh, neighborhood members that had showed up for that meeting. Uh, did not really get any opposition out of that one. Mm -hmm. um, held another one yesterday, last night. Uh, we had about three more people show up for mm -hmm. that one. And same situation, um, everybody is 
uh, excited about the project, uh, mainly because uh, we're, we're also going to clean that facility up a lot and, and kind of dress it up, uh, taking out a lot of the existing pavement, et cetera, that's around there, cleaning up the landscaping um, that's around the site and making it a lot more presentable as a project. Um, of course, this is uh, an existing church facility now, and we were going back with it as an existing church. Um, <clears throat> we have come in asking for, obviously, the special exception for the use and for the uh, nonconformance of these current setbacks, which the existing building is obviously in, uh, outreaches those existing setbacks. And the construction that's taking place is primarily just a renovation to the existing facility. Uh, there could be a little bit of an expansion into that. However, we will not be expanding into the setbacks any further than are already there. Um, the church facility actually meets only on Sunday mornings. Uh, they do not have a Sunday evening service. They do not have a Wednesday evening service either. Um, as a part of the construction outside, like I said, we are removing uh, the vast majority of the pavement that is actually there and also closing off two of the curb cuts that there are along uh, 37th and one that is right at the corner of the intersection of Park and 37th as well. Ms. Lamb, could we see the just real pictures of this? Yeah, okay. So as a part of, of the construction, like I said, that's taking place is, is the, that front entryway that's there is gonna get cleaned up with the removal of that landscaping and stuff around there. We're actually also working with the school next door. There's a, a kind of a dual fence line that runs along the right-hand side of the church. Um, that's kind of some old barbed wire fencing and a bunch of grown up landscaping that we're gonna actually replace um, in conjunction with this project for the school to kind of make that look a little nicer and cleaner in that area for them as well. Um, so the, uh, as I said, this is basically coming in um, and, and rehabbing this for an existing church facility. Uh, we are looking to expand the square footage a little bit, but still go under the allowable FAR on this particular project as well, which is uh, for the site. Okay. Looks good. Um, questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? Uh, we're just here to hopefully get your approval for this so we can continue to move forward. Okay. Thank you. We're going to... I just wanted to ask him, we have an email from uh, your council person, Ms. Murphy. Yes. <clears throat> who wanted us to verify that she has talked to the church, I don't know if that's you, actually you, on two occasions about not coming back repeatedly with additional requests. Correct. She, she just wants me to confirm that that conversation has and, taken place. Yes, and again, that has taken place. And again, the FAR is the, the reasoning as to why we are where we are at this point. And, and of course, anything that goes above basically what we are asking for today is going to require to come back for whatever uh, SP plan or whatever it may be rezoning, sure. um, which obviously everybody will be involved at that point. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Anything else to add? We're going to close the public hearing discussion. Is there opposition? Is there opposition? No? Okay. No, that's the next case. Okay. Discussion. I think they've met the requirements necessary uh, for a special exception. They have the support of the council, count, can, council person uh, based upon her email. Do you want to make that a motion? Yes. I make that a motion that we approve the special exception with the parking recommendations to be approved by Metro. Uh, I think they've already agreed to clean up the fence line. And I believe that's all. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Lamb, this is the case which was on consent. And Correct. The opposition is still here on this case. Yes, okay, so the so case 2019-055 involving property at 305 Arrington Street.
before you now is the zoning map showing you the property is uh, zoned to CL. <coughs> Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Uh, here before you now is the proposed site plan for this project. And finally, the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. The request here is to renovate an existing restaurant without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Um, because there is opposition here, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make your desired presentation. Please be sure to identify yourself by name and address. Uh, my name is Manley Seal with Powell Architecture and Buildings Studio. Address is 904A Main Street. Um, so, um, as uh, planning, uh, I said we agree with uh, planning's recommendation um, for this. Uh, it's an existing restaurant um, that we're doing um, interior renovations to, um, and uh, the existing restaurant itself is uh, uh, for a good part of the property along Arrington uh, is pretty much on the property line. Um, but there is a continuous eight foot uh, sidewalk uh, along Arrington there. Um, and then along Meridian, um, there is uh, this retaining wall uh, on the adjacent property that if we were to uh, increase the sidewalk along Meridian, um, there would be this awkward tra transition between that telephone pole and the uh, retaining wall. So what we have done is gone ahead and uh, dedicated um, uh, right away along Meridian, as plenty has said. Um, that's already been uh, set with the Register of Deeds. Um, so for future development, if, if, if these properties were to develop more, exten more extensively, that uh, right away has, has already been dedicated. Um, so that's what we're um, requesting. Um, you know, also we would lose, um, if it, we would lose a, a parking space uh, or if we had to increase the Meridian side. Um, but that's it. Why can't you pay into the Inley Fund? Um, well, it would be a, because it's a corner property. Um, I guess my client's on a limited uh, budget, and considering the fact that there's uh, a continuous... Limited budget. This is sidewalks and safety and neighborhoods, and you're a restaurant. People will be walking. But there is a, I guess what, as plenty has stated, there is a continuous sidewalk along Arrington. Um, and we have already dedicated uh, right away on the, um, along Meridian. Okay. Um, Any other questions? Oh, continue. I mean, could you, could the in lieu fee be assigned to one frontage or the other? Potentially. Okay, continue. What else? You don't, you have opposition, so of yeah. Course so I'll, I will hold. I will reserve. Okay. Time. Very good. We're, we'll hear from the opposition. Please come forward. State your name, address, and uh, the applicant will have three minutes and sixteen seconds left for rebuttal. Please state your name, address, why you're opposed to this request. My name is Steve oh, please press the button at the bottom. The bottom next to Mike. Yeah, you could leave it. Just press it once and leave it. My name is Steve Ramage. I live at 834A Lishy Avenue. What else did you need? Why are you opposed to this request? Um, I actually just came here for, not just, but primarily came here for information. I didn't really know what the variance was going to be. Okay. Um, I'm not really opposed to any of the, the zoning. I mean, there is sidewalk. Mm -hmm. It's accessible. I use it very often. I run in, in this neighborhood of living nearby. Um, I do question whether it would be wise to um, grant the the variance from the sidewalk fund. I does, that doesn't seem to be justified, but okay. if the appellant were paying the variance, I would have no opposition. Okay, very good, thank you. Will the applicant come back and um, you get to respond. So it turns out he's in general not opposed to your request, but thinks that you should pay into the fund. Um, I think we would be, uh, 
if we could limit that to the meridian side, since that is the main uh, thoroughfare that mm -hmm. would require upgrades to sidewalk anyway, and we've already dedicated uh, right away uh, that would be required sure. to upgrade that sidewalk, uh, that would be something okay. we could do. Very good. Questions of the applicant? Okay. We'll close the public hearing discussion. So the applicant has agreed to do the meridian side to pay into the fund, and they've dedicated the right-of-way discussion. I think that's not unlike some other variances were um, granted in the past. On corner lots. Right. On corner lots. So unless there's other discussion, I'll move to approve the request to pay into the in-lieu fund on the meridian side of the, of the property. And they've dedicated the right-of-way to us, he said. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Lamb. Now we come to case 2019-060 involving property at 1705 State Street, requesting a variance from sidewalk requirements to renovate apartments without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Before you is the zoning map showing the zoning of the property as MUIA. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Before you now is the proposed site plan. And finally, the uh, photo uh, photograph showing you the con current conditions of the property. Is the appellant here on this particular, oh, same appellant? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Is there anyone here in opposition to this case? Seeing none, you'll have five minutes to make your presentation for the board. Okay. Again, my name is Manley Sill with Powell Architecture and Buildings Studio, address at 904A Main Street. Um, so uh, this property uh, is an existing building, as you just saw. Uh, it's a very narrow lot. Um, it's an apartment building uh, that we are um, only, my clients only uh, re renovating as, uh, to continue as apartments, um, not changing the layout at all. Um, the existing parking that is on the lot uh, uh, is, there's, we, we're gonna make some uh, off that, uh, in the back. We have five spaces that we could put in the back. Uh, and then there's the existing five spaces that are uh, in the front um, off of State Street. If we lose those five parking spaces, we'll essentially only have five uh, spaces left on site. Um, zoning requires uh, typically one space per bed, per one bedroom. Uh, we have 14 one bedroom units. Um, you can reduce that by 25% uh, with access to transit and things like that. Um, so if we took that reduction, that would mean we'd have to provide 10 uh, spaces, which we're currently doing. So if, we're, if we have to remove these five spaces, um, we're gonna be 50% under the parking uh, count. And I know that Plenty has suggested that we might could use on-street parking. Uh, but again, typically on-street parking, you only get a half, of, half credit for each parking space. Well, and that has to be supposedly uh, abut your property too. So we're only, if, with 50 feet of uh, property, would only uh, be reducing our required amount by one. Um, because we, we can only fit two, two parallel spaces uh, along the front of our property. Um, so it, it's a, you know, to lose that much parking for an apartment um, building, I mean, essentially half of the required amount is, we consider uh, uh, quite a bit of a hardship. Okay. Have you talked to your council person about this? We have, uh, and uh, the owner was able to get him on a phone call. Um, he had no opposition to it, um, but he we have not been able to get him to send any sort of email okay. or show up. Sure. But yes. Um, so are these the only, where's the other picture, Ms. Liam, of this property? There it is. So this is kind of like the other property we heard earlier in this meeting about East Nashville. This is kind of one giant curb cut masquerading as a sidewalk. And so that's, these are the five parking spaces you're referring to? Yes. Okay. And like I said, today we would not do that. So we, if we grant this variance, same thing as last time, are you willing to pay into the fund? Yes. Okay. And is there, did planning recommend any repairs to this existing sidewalk? No, they just, I know, alternate, well, that's, 
going to make them lose parking. Um, is this sidewalk slash curb cut in pretty decent shape? I think it is. Okay, are there any places that need to be repaired or anything like that? Um, I don't think so. You can see in the picture there, it's pretty smooth all the way across. Okay. Um, questions of the applicant? How many, how many units did you say? This it's four, 14 one-bedroom units. So is there any street parking nearby on streets? I mean, just what you see in the picture there, there's just, uh, but you know, there's the, a lot of that is taken up by the apartment, the huge development across the street. Um, but people do park on the opposite side of the street alongside that. You can see that in the top picture there. Where the shrubs are, that's parking is allowed there along that side. And not for the entirety. There are certain areas that say no parking, but there are some parking allowed there. But again, it's, it's typically cars are already parked there. What are the number of parking spaces you're required to have? For our, our site? Right, for 14, 14 years. Well, it typically it would be 14, and we could reduce it by 25% uh, for access to transit, um, and things like that. So, you know, 10, 10 spaces is what we could, we could probably get it down to. And, and they currently have. have 10, including the five. The five that would be eliminated completely by the site. That's right. Other questions for the applicant? Not for the applicant, but um, I have a question whether or not if we grant this variance, um, will plan will Metro Nashville be able to come back at some point and if they're improving the whole entire street and improve this property and add the sidewalks at that time? Or is this, if we grant the variance, does it stay with this property the entire time. If I understand the question, it's if Metro chooses to come back and do, say, a block worth of sidewalk and right-of-way improvements, would that still, would this impede that? No. Typically, you're talking about everything from either right-of-way acquisition to other takings proceedings in order to get the land to do that. So I don't think that this would do anything to impede the city from pursuing that route. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. We'll close the public hearing discussion. So I'm very familiar with this. This is kind of in the Midtown Charlotte area. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's more residential over here. Sidewalks are important. Uh, but I guess a couple things, very similar to the East Nashville case, if they built new regular high sidewalks, you couldn't, I mean, this, didn't, this almost looks like just a sloping sidewalk. Usually curb cuts have the lines in them, but I guess it's technically a curb cut. Um, they would lose five parking spaces and those would be put on the street or it would prevent this from being developed. So given the fact that the applicant is willing to pay into the fund um, and that there's no opposition, they've talked to their council person about this, I think it's reasonable to do. Any other discussion? Okay, I'll make the motion. Um, I move that we approve case 060 giving them the variance from the sidewalk requirements of MUI-A, and they have to pay into the fund on the frontage of that, but they can keep the existing um, sidewalk. Okay. Uh, because of the support of the council person and the limited nature of parking on the site. So that's the motion. Is there a second? Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Well, I would just say that they would not meet the zoning requirements for parking if okay. they had to Okay, I'll make that part of the motion that we won't meet the zoning requirements for parking. So, the yes, the hardship. Okay, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, passes, and Council Lady Murphy has just arrived. So, therefore, we are taking the case at the top of the agenda. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, that was <clears throat> the motion to rehear case 2018-656. Um, one thing I would point out today, uh, per the board rules, you're not rehearing the case today, you're hearing the motion to rehear it. Okay. Um, if you grant the motion, you would rehear it on March 21st after we have it, um, after it's re-noticed, the hearing would be re-noticed. 
Um, so and I give, would, while you're saying all this, give us the 101 about how we rehear a case and why. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So when a motion to rehear is filed before the board, the board rules state that um, no request for hearing may be granted unless new evidence is submitted which could not have reasonably been presented at the previous hearing. So the issue today is whether or not evidence is available today that was not reasonably available at the hearing. I would also point out that the board rules state that motions to rehear are deliberated and decided, decided solely on the written filings and that oral arguments are not made. Of course, the council person's here and we let council people speak, but if y'all would want anyone else to speak, that would need to be, you would need to make a motion to, um, for an exception to your rules. The other issue is we're just deciding today whether we rehear this case. We're not talking about the merits of the case. We're just deciding whether we should rehear it or not. That's, That's right, and, and according to the rules, by the black letter of the rules, you're deciding that based on what was filed by the movement, um, and the issue that you're deciding today is if what was filed by the movement, movement is evidence, new evidence that is available today that was not reasonably available at the time of the hearing. And board members, you have that in your packet. It's at the top uh, 656, for motion to rehear. You see their uh, filing, um, but we have the, count the duly elected council member from the area. So Kathleen yes. Murphy, welcome to the BZA. Thank you. Uh, and I literally just walked in, so I did not see if the neighbors, there we go, neighbors are here about this case or not. Um, and let me again thank you for rolling me down the docket. I had a work conflict come up. Um, and so I know that the neighbors have filed this motion to rehear, and it was based upon um, the, the discussion that was before you when this case originally, uh, or the second time the case came before you. The first time this case was before you, I was here for some other, for some other issues. Uh, this case had been on consent. It was bumped from consent by some neighbors. And so when addressing you with my comments on a different case, I kind of ran through the docket in front of you and I mentioned that as most of y'all have heard my soapbox, that I don't think that the Board of Zoning Appeals is the Board of Forgiveness, um, that there are... Um, Can I be appointed to that board? Yeah, we know, right, right? Like that, I'll, I'll look into the charter amendment that that might, <laughs> that might uh, be required for. So, so at that time, um, I came before you and I told you on that case, this case, uh, 656, um, that when, when you were making your your judgment on it, because ultimately it is up to the, the Board of Zoning Appeals to adjudicate these issues, that my position is, is that uh, you're not the Board of Forgiveness. And it was my understanding that this, this per, or th there was not a permit for this garage um, when it was built, and that's what kind of had flagged, I think, and started this case. And so my concern is, is that um, a lot of times in the neighborhoods across the county, things are being built without permits. And they're not always caught until neighbors kind of ask questions or wonder how did this happen, or maybe that that looks a little funny. Um, and so that's how some of these cases come before you. And so when, and, and it's actually something that I think I've brought before you when a house was demoed without a permit and it led to a series of, of BZA cases in front of you over the past two or three years. Um, and so my point was being that it needs to be taken into consideration when y'all are adjudicating these cases that if something is built without a permit, um, my concern as a council member is not just that they, that the person who built without a permit is paying, I think it is three times tripling the, <laughs> tripling the fees. That's something that's important to me. Mm -hmm. But I know that because of state law and things, that's usually not a significant amount of money, especially like when it comes to like, you didn't cut your grass three times, I think that's only like $150 or something. I mean, our fees are, and our fines are extremely low. So a lot of times these are slaps on the wrist when it comes to um, punishment for doing something without permission. So that was kind of the reasoning behind my soapbox that many of y'all heard um, and have heard and will continue to hear. I'm sorry that I don't think that you're bored of, of forgiveness. And so um, when the case came before you the second time, between the first time when the applicant deferred it and the second time when y'all ruled on it, I spoke to both the applicant and the neighbor. Um, I was sent the same documentation that y'all had been sent, pictures of, of the of the fence of the of the garage all of those types of things 
When I spoke to the applicant who built without the permit, I said, send me, send me your case, send me your arguments, because of course he was trying to sway me, naturally, um, to, to, um, to his side. And I told him, let me read what your argument is for this. Let me see the pictures that you have to support your case, and I can see if I can become more neutral, but I, I need to see your, your documentation. Um, when it came that this case was before you again, I was not going to be able to be here. Um, I told both the applicant and the neighbors who were opposing the applicant that I wasn't going to be here. But again, always in best, you know, best practices, neighbors need to have other neighbors support them and that type of thing. It came to my, um, I guess I was told after the case was before you and after you decided that the applicant had told you I'd become neutral in this situation and I was not neutral in this situation. I've spoken to Mr. Dillingham about that. He apologized for the misunderstanding and misrepresenting my position to you, but I am not so neutral. So he acknowledged that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so, so in this case, my position stays the same. Um, my position is always the same when it comes to building without a permit. You shouldn't build without a permit. Um, but at the end of the day, as I said before, it is up to this body to determine kind of punishment or, or the working out of the situation. Um, and so the neighbors felt, and I think that's what they are, they're asking for the rehearing on, is the new information that my position did not become neutral. Um, this is a situation where, again, the permit should have been pulled, but when it comes down to the facts of the case, that is something for y'all to look more into and make your, your reasoning and arguments upon, because I'm not in your position, and sometimes very grateful for that. I have my own uh, can of worms at the council. Um, but again, my position is, is that building it without a permit is something that is not acceptable and should be taken into consideration when determining cases like this. Okay, excellent. Any questions for Council Lady Murphy? We really appreciate you coming back again sure. and speaking on this case. And while you're still up here, I want to read part of the um, motion to reconsider that the, was filed by um, Dan and Melissa Beauchart. Um, and they quote you, and this is why I'm reading it. Um, this is from our meeting on December 6th, 2018. And this is on the YouTube video, which they took advantage of on the Metro National Network. So here you go. I want, this is quoting you. I wanted to lend my support to them, meaning the neighbors, and encourage you, meaning the BZA, to deny the variance because, again, it's not forgiveness. When you don't get a permit, there are consequences for that. And that's what you said on the 6th. And then uh, what you were saying at the other meeting on January 3rd that you weren't able to attend, this is what Mr. Dillingham said that you said. She, meaning Kathleen Murphy, has spoken to a neighbor and was given information that was not correct. I have spoken with her since, and she has, like, become neutral. So there is the characterization. So um, any other questions based on that, board members? Okay. We will um, deliberate about this motion of uh, whether to rehear. Um, to me, since I'm not on the board of forgiveness yet, um, <laughs> I think when you mischaracterize a uh, council person who has previously taken a very strong opinion on this to this board, that is enough for me to ask for this to be reheard. What do you all think? I don't know. I mean, given the situation of a, of an existed existing building that was built without a permit, I don't know how this would change the income or the outcome. Sorry, of, of the case. But, but as we said, we're just deciding whether to rehear the case or not. We're not arguing the facts. And well, I, I guess what I'm considering is, is what what would be the purpose in rehearing? What what would be the benefit, and what could the possible outcome be? Uh, I mean, there's only two choices. But once know, again, I mean, we find we find the same thing, or they have to tear it down. What we're looking for today is whether the case should be reheard, not the merits of. Well, and I think it's happen. based on evidence that could have been known at the time. We, the the 
the applicant uh, mischaracterized, I don't know that it was malicious that he mischaracterized the position of the council person. Uh, and we had heard from the council person's mouth what our position was. So I mean, it was really up to us to determine whether he was saying it was But what he said not. was it had changed. So even if we remembered, you know, and I remembered actually, because I think I asked that uh, the applicant, are you sure the council person is now? But I think that also works on the presumption that we would have made our decision based solely on what the council person said, which I don't think that's how I make these decisions. But so once again, I mean, we're not talking about the merits of the case. We're talking about whether we should rehear it. So well, does does that but I'm saying, in my opinion, the, evi the so-called evidence that's being presented doesn't rise to a level that would affect my opinion of the case. Okay. Other members? I'm just gonna talk out loud because I'm I'm torn on this kind of issue because if the standard is pretty high, it is on new evidence that could not reasonably have been present. And I don't think this is the first time we've had a situation where we've had an applicant, we relied on what an applicant said about an official. And so I think it, then it does put a lot of pressure on council people and other officials to convey to us the, what their position is. Not that it's always the only thing we rely on, but I think we all do take into consideration those opinions. I don't know whether this person mischaracterized it, you know, maliciously or not, but uh, I agree with you. I don't know it's the only thing that we would have liked. This was a six, I remember that this was a six inch uh, request. And so, and it was built where an existing structure was built. I tend to think, I, I, what do other people think? Because I'm not, I'm not sure where I come down. Well, I, I don't like that we were told something that wasn't accurate, whether it was malicious or not malicious. I don't, I don't like that. I don't think it, it changes the result. And because it was, as I recall, it was six inches. It was built on an existing slab and the hardship was proven. And as I recall, the neighbor's main problem with it was the, the or one of the problems was the materials they used in the construction. And, and that was not gonna change. They had, that was not in violation of any kind of zoning ordinance. So I guess the, it seems to me like if the standard is, if there's new evidence that was not reasonably available, we have to be careful there because I mean, it, it, it can't mean just any slight new evidence. I mean, if somebody, for example, based a, a request on a plan that was off by one inch, are we gonna reopen the hearing because- but, but I think we're getting bogged down into that. What we're supposed to do is decide if there's a reason to rehear the case. And what I've heard today is, just because it was only six inches and, oh, we're probably gonna rule the same way anyway, we shouldn't do it. But that's not what's in front of us. What's in front of us was, were we given incorrect information and therefore the people because of that can ask for a new hearing. But and I, I understand, but I don't think that, that that standard has to encompass more than this were we given incorrect information because if, just, if we're given incorrect information that is just very de minimis, it seems like that ought to make a difference in whether yes. the case can Well, I agree with that, but can, I don't think uh, the- Can we, the, can you read the standard again just so that we're- The support of a council person or not is not de minimis. That's, that weighs and a lot for me. The board members have correctly identified the terms under board rules of procedure, post hearing request, which is item 10 among the rules. A, request for a hearing. Number two, no such, re no such request to grant a rehearing shall be considered unless new evidence is submitted which could, not have been re which could not have reasonably been presented at the previous hearing. Operative language there, Mr. Peppers, probably unless new evidence is submitted which could not have reasonably been presented at the previous hearing. So that's what the board's deciding. Does this evidence rise to that standard? And if so, and you vote to grant the motion, then there'll be a new hearing set. David, I also, I mean, I'm, I'm really am, I think it's a tough, I think we need to be mindful of what we're doing. I know we all are. 
but when I, in looking back, I mean, it would have been one thing if he'd said, she's for me now, but that was not what we had. I mean, he said but, that it was a But she was previously neutral. strongly opposed and know, neutral, and, and know, that's a big swing. I agree. Well, I don't call that a swing. I just say the council person is not taking a position at that point. But, and, you know, it, it puts us in a situation to be between constituents. If we're doing it, what happens is, I think probably because this is the real world, maybe people aren't always 100% truthful with us when they come here at all. But we have to take them at, I mean, we, you know, but we have to take the evidence. Everyone has the right to come back and file one of these and says, you know what, that last meeting, someone didn't was not truthful, and here we are. And this doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a lot. And it surely and doesn't happen a lot with a Handle these cases person. the same in a similar manner when we try to do it this way, because really what we're saying is what what this applicant said was, un I almost feel like if somebody comes back before us, are we even in a position to rehear it? If what we're saying is you were untruth, we believe you were untruthful to us based on this. Somebody's come in and said you gave us wrongful information. Do, they, do we then rely on anything else we said? Are we then in a position where we've but, got to assess? But what I just don't agree with from my colleagues here is people are just already trying to say, well, even if we reheard it, it's going to be about the same, or it's only six inches. So what's the big deal? Well, you know? I, well but I haven't made up my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out as we're. I, I haven't dismissed your. I think it's a, it's not an easy question, and I, and I, and I don't like that we did base our decision on something that is now inaccurate. And I'm, I'm just kind of struggling with. I don't want to get into a situation here where we open up a can of worms because there's a some. We, we get lots of motions to reconsider because something is incorrect that was said that didn't make a difference to us. And I'm, I'm not saying, Mr. Ewing, that I, I disagree with you. I, I'm here reading the standard again. Um, I mean, there, there was opposition at the hearing, was, was it not? To my recollection. So, I mean, it is reasonable that that could have been refuted in the opposition. But how would they have known? They might not have known. Or it was presented at a time where the opposite, after the opposition spoke, I don't remember, but you know, we were, it's not open, we can't. We're based on what what's in this paper. Well, I mean, t the, yeah. the standard, oh, I'm sorry. The, 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 the standard is new evidence is submitted which could not have reasonably been presented at the previous hearing. I think an argument could be made that even though the council person couldn't have been here, that that evidence still could have been presented. I disagree with that because a council person, as I read earlier, had strongly opposed this and you wouldn't have any reason to think that she changed her mind. Um, I mean, and when this new evidence was there, that that was untrue. But. You know, what's the council person to do? Write us every single meeting saying, hey, I haven't changed my mind? You know, to me, I give a lot of weight to our elected officials, people that got elected and represent their neighborhoods. And so when that person says their words were incorrectly presented to us, that means a lot. I mean, I don't disagree with that, of course. I don't disagree with that either. I but I still think the opportunity was available to, to challenge the assertion that the council person had become neutral despite her 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 testimony in, in, in the case. So, I mean, we're given uh, contradictory information often in cases. I and guess we have to decide who do we believe. Well, the difference in contradictory and false. This is false. Well, well, that's a philosophical question. I mean, two things can be contradictory. I guess I would false. say, if we take the take who is, I guess let's look at it this way: if somebody, an applicant, came in and said my neighbor is for this, and that was false, and it later came back before us, I would feel, I believe, I would be motivated for the neighbor to be present, be able to present their opposition, and so I guess in looking at it. 
and just removing who we're talking about, just uh, and looking at the way the case should properly be presented, I suppose uh, it makes sense to me that we could rehear it on that basis. I think we would in this scenario I just described because somebody's view, of course, I guess she would have been noticed and had the right to be here had that happened. And then they would have waived that. Okay, I'm, I'm talking in circles. I'm going to stop But talking. if they said my neighbor's for it and they weren't, that's pretty substantial. Yeah, but the neighbor should have been here. But what if the neighbor wrote us a letter saying I'm against it, kind of like the council person said the meeting before, and then, okay. oh, I'm f they're for it now. No, I mean, we don't want to give people kind of an incentive to put false information in front of us that we make our decisions on. I, I, you've convinced me. I, I, I just wanted to be careful here because I think we're, we're, whenever we reopen hearings, we want to make sure. Okay, we're, well, the, then careful. I will make a motion that we rehear case 656 uh, based on the brief. Um, that listed that Councilor Murphy's position on this was incorrectly stated and that the applicant admitted that they incorrectly stated um, Councilor Murphy's. And we'll hear the case again. When do we know? That's my motion. Okay. So. If, if the motion prevails, you, it would be reheard on March 21st. Okay. Here, well, let me just add to that. Mm -hmm. I think from, we're, we need to start this a, a new way and say we're not going to take the position that the applicant acknowledged or admitted anything, I don't think. I think we just say we've got the council person okay, in here sure. to say that she... Okay, I'll change the motion to that. Okay. okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the rehearing signify by saying aye. Okay. Aye. Opposed? Four to one. We get to rehear it. See you soon. Okay. Ms. Lamb, we'd like to take a break. Sure, we'll take a five minute break. Before you now is a zoning map showing you the zoning of the property. It's R8. Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Proposed site plan showing you the project at this property. And then finally, the photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 66? Seeing none, the appellant will have five, five minutes to make your presentation. Please be sure before, to state your before name. Before we address. get started, remind us what this item A case is really about and what we do in item A cases. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to defer to the zoning administrator on this no. one since this was his decision that is being appealed. It was your fault. Yeah, it's all my fault. We, we get that a lot, don't we? Um, okay, item A cases generally. The appellant files an appeal challenging a determination by the zoning staff, or in this case, the zoning administrator, uh, typically under the guise of um, arguing that the zoning administrator either incorrectly applied the law or inc incorrectly interpreted the law that's in question. Here, the law at issue has to do with the number of floors that are allowed in this residential structure. It's important to note right from the outset, as we get into it, that this is within the height restriction. And I believe it was uh, a 45-foot height restriction, and this is built, uh, Mr. Kelly, at 42. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so just make sure we're on the same page there. It's within the height restriction, but there is a, a restriction on the number of stories, and it's three stories within the 45, and we've determined that this is four. The... Um, slide that Ms. Lamb has up on the PowerPoint presentation here, particularly the lower right-hand corner, the uh, elevation seen there, partic most particularly the one on the left, is the best one to look to as I kind of explain where the zoning administrator and zoning staff came down with the determination that this was four instead of three. As you can tell from the, from the site plan, or from the elevations rather, uh, it's uh, kind of a PC bit of architecture in terms of the way the style of the house is laid out. Uh, all the elevations, site plans, and renderings we saw look really cool, look really great. That's 
not the issue, and it's never the issue in zoning, it's whether something looks good, however this one does. But as you can see, the garage there, uh, again, lower right hand elevations and the one on the left, the garage is there in the lowest right hand corner of that rendering. The garage has a slight step up, only visible in the right hand rendering there, of approximately six to eight steps, at least five, but maybe six to eight steps to go up into what is marked as I think the living or den area. From there, another five, six, seven steps up into the kitchen area. At that point, we're starting to question, okay, is that all the same floor? Is the garage and the living area and the kitchen all the same floor? Hard to argue that it's the same floor when you look at the orientation of the kitchen relative to the garage. Clearly one is on top of the other. Not as hard when you look at the living room vis-a-vis -vis the positioning of the kitchen. Maybe you would say those are the same floor, particularly given that they share a ceiling line that's continuous along there. As to the second floor, that's clear. As to the third floor, where you've kind of got a, a decks, deck area outside the third floor bonus area, that's pretty clearly defined as well. It's thus at the lower part of the structure where we got it a little bit hung up trying to determine, do we really, is this a work around the three floor restriction uh, to have the garage oriented as it is vis-a-vis -vis the kitchen and the living area? Or do we think that somehow works with the third floor and we should just ignore the garage? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the determination was because you have that six or eight steps as seen in the right hand rendering that goes from garage into the living area and another five or six into the kitchen area, which is right on top of the garage, we couldn't quite land on that this was three. Even if there is such a thing as a three and a half story structure, a three, a, a three and a half story structure, a three story maximum would be exceeded in that regard. So it seemed like an appropriate case to present to the board for their review to determine whether or not this was uh, an incorrect interpretation of law vis-a-vis -vis the three story requirement. I believe all, Mr. Kelly has also filed a variance kind of as a in the alternative type argument. If the board determines that no, this was not an error on the part of the zoning staff, then you could consider through a variance whether or not anything about the land or the structure represented a hardship such it would be appropriate to give a variance on that. Um, happy to take questions if you have them, but that's our overview. Okay, so this is an item a case board members and the zoning administrator has said that this is a four-story house, not a three-story house, so therefore we get to hear what, why he is wrong from the applicant and we get to determine if... Let me ask, I, I think that ...requesting a variance, and I see that on the application too, so is there, are there two issues to determine here? Same operative set of facts, if you say uh, yes, the item A is granted, then the variance request is moot. If you determine that the item A request is denied, thus that the zoning administrator was correct in the interpretation of law, then you get to take up the variance request okay. for permission to have that greater number of floors. So there are potentially two different issues here. And there could be two votes potentially, yes. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Okay. Very good. Please state your name, address, and why you're here. I'm Ronnie Kelly, owner of uh, 1010 Alice Street, as well as the builder. And I'm here to seek assistance and how do I reverse uh, any type of oppositions that we have for something I've already been permitted to do. Okay, so when you, you said you had the permit, so did you submit this particular plan when you got your permit? Yes, sir, I did. Okay, and when did they, because it seems like, uh, Ms. Lamb, can you show us the picture of the actual house? So a lot of construction already done. Yes, sir. So, between when did they tell you, oh, wait a minute, this is four stories? Uh, framing inspection, uh, Sam oh, Ryder. framing inspection, okay. Yeah, Ronald Ryder came out and uh, he was inspecting for my framing and uh, that's when he brought it to my attention that he felt that we needed to bring it back to zoning and let them take a look at it. But you literally submitted those other plans that we had said, that's what yes, you sir. submitted? Okay. Yeah. Um, please. Uh, make your case today. Well, uh, of course, I would have changed them had I been given the opportunity to do so. Um, if you look at the uh, front elevation of the uh, home, I could have simply lowered the front porch and the rest of the uh, living and dining room areas and we wouldn't have had an issue. But uh, had I known that and given that opportunity to do so, I would have done such. And as John Michael said, we're not looking at the height issue because you're under the 45 but maximum which you're allowed to build in Davidson County, it's just number of stories. So Davidson County has 45 feet maximum and three stories. Yes, sir. So, and it looks like the house is next door, maybe slightly taller if we count the gables and the roofing and all that. Yes, sir. 
Is there any uh, opposition to this? I know you, you put out the red sign, and has anyone said anything to you? Um, no, nah, I actually have a, a neighbor here that's in support of um, the vote. position I'm in. Okay, bring the neighbor up. We want to hear from them. <laughs> Please state your name, address, and why you are in support of this. Uh, my name's Joseph McDonald. Oh, please. Yeah. My name's Joseph McDonald. I've got the house to the left of Ronnie, 1008 A Alice Street. The one with the gables? The one beside the gray one there, the almost white Oh, you can't one. see it in this picture? Yes, you can, okay. to, the, to the left of it there. Okay. And so what do you think of this? I think it's beautiful. So you're totally in support, you don't see anything I've wrong. toured this house. To me, I would call it, I said, great, this is a, you know, a three-story house. There's a first floor. If you're in the kitchen and you're in the living room, you would see that it's got one story. Mm -hmm. Any <coughs> questions for uh, the neighbor? Oh, not for the neighbor. I won't okay, that. yeah, for the sure. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, thank you. We really appreciate that. Yeah, do, do I understand the plans were approved and, and you didn't find out until construction was underway that you weren't in compliance with zoning? Is that what yes, happened here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, you know, the codes as part of the safety and just making sure people are building what they submitted, there's an inspection, they come out and they look at it, and so it was that inspector that said, hey, this might not be three stories. Right, but the, the, the plans that we are seeing here are the same plans you submitted initially to get your permit, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And he's building to exactly what the permit said? Correct, yeah, okay. Okay. Any um, questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? Um, I know what to do going forward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yes, We're going to close the public hearing discussion. So um, I kind of agree with you without hearing what you say that, you know, if you submitted the plans, that was the time where Metro should have said, hey, this is four stories. And now that this is pretty substantial, um, as he said, he would have easily kind of fixed this you know, it appears to me like a, from the outside, it looks like a three-story house, even though if you look in the inside, it's got the weird stairs and all that. And compared to the other two houses next door, it actually looks shorter, you know. So what do you all think, well, our I architects? Will, yeah, I will offer that in the building code, not the zoning code, there is something that defines whether or not something is a story and it's based on the grade plane. And don't ask me to explain it anymore right now. But it does seem that some of your garage might be, may may not by the building code, be considered a story possibly because it looks like you're building on a maybe a slope site or, or I guess you said you raised the porch. But I don't know. I mean, there's that to maybe consider next time you're you're uh, building something. But I agree with you all that it doesn't exceed the height restriction too, which I think is a factor. Other comments? Well, it seems to me, I mean, I don't know that I would argue that the zoning administrator erred because there isn't, it seems on its face, it looks like it's more than three, even if it's not four uh, stories. But I certainly think it's appropriate to consider a variance. That's sort of how I would analyze it anyway. That That's sort of where I land on this. I mean, I could easily make an argument that it's, uh, if, if you look at the the section that's on the lower drawing on the left, I can almost see it as two three two separate three story sections that are offset, which I don't know if it. Oh, I see what you're saying. To the letter of the law, that's, yeah. That's an interesting argument. It's hard to look at the garage, you know, when you look at the garage, the kitchen, and I can't tell what that is above it, but that that's, that, that's three stories, the and in the back there's three stories. Yeah, the front half is three stories, and that's an interesting argument. So, but I don't know that, I don't know that I would say the administrator uh, erred, and I, I think that... If I use your three-story argument in the front and the back, I could say that, but that's a, that's a very interesting, per but literally if you cut the building in half, the front part has three stories, and then the back part and has I would, three stories. And I would say that on a non-precedential basis. <laughs> I think this is such a, a different kind of design that we wouldn't see too many of those. Or well, I, I, wouldn't, would, I wouldn't want someone to come back here and, and say, 
um, I've offset each room four feet in a spiral all the way up to 45 feet and you know you've got 10 stories you know because none of the stories are more than two or three feet apart but I think this is I think that I think the harm would be de minimis to anybody the legal kind of it doesn't matter to him whereas as a variance or if John Michael was wrong you know he still gets to keep what he right it's the same effect okay so that being said, who wants to take a stab at this? Well, I would move. move that the zoning administrator did not err, but that we should uh, grant a variance for this. Um, based on, do we want to say this is the general catch-all rule of the topography and they've already started? Extraordinary circumstances. Extraordinary circumstances. Okay. Uh, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. You get to keep it. Keep building. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Next case, Ms. Lamb. Next case is case 2019-074 involving property at 16 Shepherd Street requesting a variance from lot size front setback and sidewalk requirements to construct a single family residence without building sidewalks or paying into the fund. Zoning map here shows you the zoning of the property is R6. <coughs> Aerial photography giving you a sense of the surrounding area. Before you now is the proposed site plan and finally photograph showing you the current conditions of the property. Josh Helmer is the appellant here. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to this case? Seeing none, Mr. Helmer, you have five minutes to make your presentation. Please identify yourself by name and address. <clears throat> Josh Helmer, 1071 2nd Avenue South. Why are we here? I'm asking for a lot size variance. Uh, that's the first uh, and most important one. All of the lots on the street are um, pretty much conforming at the 25 feet wide by 135 feet deep, I believe. And it makes it under the minimum uh, 3750 square feet. Um, also, when asking for that variance, uh, you have to use the three foot side setbacks. So that comes into play here. Um, I believe I also asked for a sidewalk variance, or it was included, but uh, I'm not asking for that. We will pay in, the lieu, in lieu of fee. Like we did at 18 Shepherd next door, where we have started building. So, what is the? Well, I'll ask Miss Lamb. What's the size of the lot required, and what is he uh, proposing? Is this? Uh, let me look at the application. The Shepherd case, 074. If you go back to the site plan picture, I think it states the square footage, maybe in the bottom left corner. Okay, so it's. Minimum lot size 3750. That's and right. I'm sorry. I'm asking for 3425. So That's right. About 10%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And eight, 18 Shepherd right next door, we did a variance maybe so three or four months ago that was yeah, granted. 9%. So. 9%. Okay. And, we, and we've started at 18 Shepherd and we intend on building the same thing at 16 if granted the variance. So what's your hardship on this? Uh, it's just that's the uh, how Metro planted it uh, back in the day, the 25 you mean, by you 1. Mean the width of the lot. Yes, correct. The width of the lot. It's just um, that's the size of the lots up there, and unfortunately, it's under the 3750. The poor old days of Trimble Bottom. Okay, so um, which I'm not sure where Chestnut Hill came from. Some developer, not a historic name. Don't like those. Um, questions for the applicant. Okay. Anything else to add? No. Nope. Question. Yeah. Talk with your council person about this who's looking for indicated. Sorry, I'm sorry. Who's we we were? You may have been here earlier mm -hmm. for the earlier appeal, uh, but apparently he is wanting to find a more comp comprehensive approach to these yeah. smaller lots. Yes, yeah, Councilman I, Sledge opposes this too. Right. How would you feel about a deferral? Yeah, I did not know that it was um, opposed. He was in favor of 18 right next door where we're yeah. currently building. Um, I know that he's in opposition of some of the really small lots. I've actually yeah. been on the receiving end of those variances in the past, which I'm uh, thankful for. Yeah, um, I, I didn't know he opposed this I, one. I think this is a little different because he's 91% there, and it's not a huge ask of difference between 3750 and 3425, unlike the previous case so 
to me and that we've just basically, the one next door is very similar. This isn't just one of those you look at yourself and say, that's a lot to ask. Yeah, and, and the one that shows the house, 20 Shepherd, that house does still exist. Um, and then you can see some of the underlying lot lines. So it was just unfortunate that the lots were only 25 feet wide back in the day. So to me, in my opinion, there are two types of lots that, you know, that probably the council person objects to that he might be lumping into one. There are substandard lots, which is like the other case that we saw that we deferred, and just kind of small lots or narrow lots. I wouldn't say this is a substandard lot that nobody would want to buy and you buy for a tax sale for a thousand dollars, you know. So. I understand, but he re does refer in his letter opposing this. Oh, I know. That's you why know, I say... He refers specifically to this property. That's But, why but he calls this a substandard lot. I wouldn't call this a substandard lot. I, you know, the other one clearly was, given how tiny, tiny it was, this is just a small, narrow lot. I would agree. I think it's just the way it was plotted. It's less than 25 feet wide, actually. I don't think it was intended to be unbuildable. It wasn't subdivided that way, the way the other lot earlier no. seemed to be a subdivision of a larger property. Mr. Chairman, you didn't ask, but just so that the board knows, in instances where we have lots that are below 3,750 square feet, which is the minimum lot size for this kind of construction, if in fact there was, it was originally platted that way and there was a home on the structure previously, we do allow demolition and rebuild or allow you to build back in that scenario at the, at the, the interpretation from the zoning division dating back not just to Mr. Herbert but to Mr. West and carried through to Mr. Herbert now to me. So. It's not an unprecedented notion to have houses on lots despite being smaller than 3750. It's just that absent a lot size variance for a property that has not had a house on it previously, or at least we can't confirm that it's had a house previously, this is the appropriate step. But in many instances, if there was a house, we just proceed. Yeah, and I appreciate you actually bringing that up because I believe um, uh, the, the woman who contacted me about purchasing this property, her family lived at 20 at one point in time, and 18, which is now 18, that was zero before I asked for the variance, never had a house. But she did recall a house being on 16 when she was a child. Yeah. And there probably was, but just a very modest structure. Yeah, it was probably something very small. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. So, like I said, I make a big distinction between substandard lots and just narrow lots or, you know, things like this. The other lot just was almost as a fire sale of $1,000. These lots are not the same. And as the applicant said that, you know, probably at one time that there was a house on this. So um, that's kind of how I feel about it. Other people. I agree. And I will make a motion if... Unless there's other comments? Okay. Um, I will move to approve the variance request for um, smaller lot size um, due to the fact that it's a narrow lot, as well as the um, request for a 16-foot front setback to be in line um, with the neighboring properties, and also acknowledge that the applicant agreed to pay into the sidewalk and loop fund. Okay. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Lamb. Mr. Chairman, we have one more case <clears throat> to be considered by the board, and that it's a short-term rental case. Oh, case we're in short terms already. That's right. Case 2019-072. Involving property at 754 Benton Avenue, requesting an item appeal, appeal challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a, or I'm sorry, cancellation rather of a short-term rental permit. This is one that was canceled due to a change in ownership. Is there anyone here in opposition to this case? Yes. So that being the case, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make your presentation. Um, if you want to have any rebuttal, withhold that from the original 10 minutes. Um, for the board, uh, just some general background. The owner of this property who obtained the permit in 2015 was Autumn Andrade. In February of 2018, the property was quick claimed to Autumn and Gerald Andrade. And then in September of 2018, the property was quick claimed again to G Gerald Andrade. 
when it came to the attention of codes that multiple um, ownerships, er, mul ownership had changed rather multiple times. We notified the owner that the permit was no longer valid according to state and local law, and that is when he filed his appeal. So Mr. Andrade, you'll have 10 minutes now. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Jerry Andrade of 754 Benton. Um, the, the property changes are correct. They happened in uh, relation to a divorce that took place the final decree is in February of 2018. Uh, the packets are being handed out now. So essentially the property changed hands first to us jointly and then um, ended up on my side of the divorce. In the, the packet you're receiving now, you'll have documentation of the divorce. Upon notification that uh, the properties had been canceled, I did terminate bookings. You'll see emails next in your packet five emails of uh, showing that I reached out to people that had reserved the property and canceled those reservations. I also have, following that, um, a spreadsheet that refers to, it's in very small text, but it's a spreadsheet that shows there haven't been any complaints launched against this particular, or lodged against this property. And then finally, the tax history documents that uh, show that taxes were paid appropriately up until September when I received the notification, and then another tax history document showing that we ceased operations, and there was no further bookings and no further tax filings. So really that's, that, that's all I have. The property changed hands due to a divorce. I understand that is still a change of title. I've watched many of these cases on the live stream YouTube videos, so. I mean on the Metro National Network. That's right, I want to get one more mention of it on the Metro National Network. And so I'm aware of the fact that if the title changes, the title changes. Um, as the, the board may recall, in some of these cases, it's been referenced that there are extenuating circumstances and sometimes divorce is considered one of those. So I'll just stop there for questions. So you receive the letter from Metro, and then you cancel these five future bookings and haven't re-listed um, your property. That's since. right. So the, the, the letter was actually sent to, to my ex-wife. Okay. And so there is a short period in September where the letter was sent in August, and then in September was when I actually received the letter okay. because it went to her house. So Ms. Lamb, we don't have anyone from uh, the short-term rental. Mr. Osborne is back at the back. Oh. Good evening, see Mr. Osborne, sneak in, you're normally sit up here. Come back and tell us about this property, how you heard about it, any other kind of things that we would need to know. So this property began being operated back in uh, 2014 and operated until G uh, September 2018, about 198 rentals. Uh, it was issued a permit on May 12th of 2015. Um, we, re we have received some complaints for this property. Um, on July 23rd of 2018, a complaint was filed about advertising for 20 people. And then uh, basically the same complaint was filed on December 28th, 2017. And then there was a complaint of screaming and intoxicated people on September 15th of 2017. Um, we did send a notice on March 9th of 2017 for not displaying permit information and advertising over occupancy in too many bedrooms. Um, I had to issue a warrant um, on 525 for repeat violation of that uh, for excess occupancy in bedrooms. Um, the permit was canceled on 823, 2018 for the change in ownership. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay, thank you. So you were advertising 20 people? So I, I don't even recall that, but chances are there was just a mistake in the listing. We did resolve it, as you'll see on the, on the listings here. It, it did not go past the, the warning as far as I recall, but Mr. Osborne may have more, more so information on that. how many people that. under our law, under our code, are you allowed to rent to at one time? The maximum is, is 12. There's four, four bedrooms allowed, um, two people per bedroom plus, plus four, if I'm correct. So it's been a learning process. I mean, from 15 through 18, I'm sure Mr. Osborne will agree, there's, there's a lot of new legislation that's come out. And while it is the responsibility of a homeowner, lots of things have changed throughout the process. A lot of the learning happens just by hearing these cases and uh, getting these notices. It, it's not always easy. Okay, so part of your divorce decree, you get this property 100%? That's correct. Okay. So, and you intend to operate it still as a short-term rental? If permitted. Okay. Other questions of the applicant? Okay. 
Okay, anything else to add? No, I'd like to reserve the time though. For opposition, okay. Opposition, please come forward, state your name, address, why you're opposed to this. Hello, uh, Matthew Olson, 751 Roycroft Place. Uh, it's the home just to the north. I'm Renee Olson, 751 Roycroft Place. So why are you here and why do you oppose this particular request? Several reasons. One, um, if I understand this right, there was an application that was denied, correct? Revoked. Revoked. Because of change of ownership. Right. So when ownership changes under our strict laws on short-term rentals, then you lose the permit and you have to reapply. Gotcha. Well, I guess I would like to say I would like it to stay revoked. The Several of the cases, several of the things pointed out by Jerry, I, mean, I wish him no ill will, but if you guys could draw that picture out, you would notice that he and Autumn, you probably can't own a huge volume of the houses around there. They have Airbnb'd, VRBO'd, oh. fake VRBO'd, much so, of the wait, property wait, what's in the neighborhood. Fake never People heard of that. would email them on Airbnb and they would say, call me at this number. Um, I met a few ladies who rented a house. Trying at to stay under the radar of Mr. Osborne, are you trying to say that? There have been listings. So, we have pictures. The posting that they used to have posted said, this might not be the house you're in. Two houses, message for more information, don't book direct. It doesn't say don't book direct. It said don't. I mean, I have photos. Um, and the permit that was listed was, let me pull it up here. There's a pretty um, long it history was a of picture Jerry of on our, in our neighborhood renting out multiple homes, shuffling which ones they own, permit and number which ones they reside in, two zero one five one eight nine four one, and then four zero were listed in the photos, and they don't line up with the addresses that were in the photos. Um, there are two houses on Roycroft Place, which. So you're seeing Benton Avenue, and then the street, if you're looking at it like I am, is just above this Roycroft Place, which is where we live. You can't see it in this photo, but um, there are two houses on Roycroft Place that do not, have not had permits in it, over a year. But who owns them? They do, Jerry and Autumn. I don't know who owns But do they one. rent them so, out for short term? Yes. yes. How do you know? Because I've talked to the people renting them. Because when every they Thursday time. night, our street fills up with Ubers. With Airbnb. And there are drunk girls falling out. I mean, I pick up beer cans drunk Sunday night. Girls, bachelorettes. Yes. Maybe. Well, they're all large, gorgeous houses that they have restored mm -hmm. impeccably. Just, they're mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful. But um, our beautiful little Woodland and Waverly, Woodland and Waverly neighborhood. I don't know if you guys. Have ever been I there. know it very well. It's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. And, and there are families and there are older couples and um, like people like us, we've lived there 10 years. And um, it is less of a neighborhood and more of a hotel. And we've reported, we've gone through the Airbnb reporting system yeah. and reported okay. when we found these infractions, we've made notices. So. Okay. so getting back to what we're here for today, this is kind of a change of ownership for this one particular property. Mm -hmm. So what are you objecting to us giving or allowing him to reapply for this one particular property? There has not been in good faith. They have not handled this as a short-term rental properly. There have been large groups, much larger than what they've been allowed. So larger than 12, do you think? Yes. yes. I have counted 20 guys in the backyard having big bonfires back there. There's cars. How do, you, how do you know that they're staying in there as opposed to visiting and having a party? Fair enough. It could be a party Jerry's had, but it's very consistently Thursday night to Sunday, Thursday to Sunday. I mean, it's like we call it Boots Thursday at our house because Thursday night, it's literally, we've, I've had girls, I've been in the backyard doing yard work and I had six girls stroll up my driveway going, uh, is this where we're supposed to check in? And I'm like, check in? They're like, where's the key? And I'm like, what? They were already inebriated and they're looking for their Airbnb. I'm in like, the afternoon already. I'm like, there are no Airbnbs on this street, ma'am. I, I will say, I don't think that uh, the Benton Avenue location that's in question right now, I don't think it has been rented out in the last few Agreed. months. Okay. I, I agree well, with he's, that. He's but I've seen there are other, there are ones on Roycroft and I know there's an additional house on Benton that used to be listed and I, I don't I don't have like a bird's eye view of that because it's not 
my next door neighbor. Um, but I do know that these have been rented, the other properties have been rented out. And so because of that, I don't feel that the permit that was, that was had previously was handled and respected and okay. it's- Well, I want to call Mr. Osborne back up here. So, you know, these folks say that the same individual or former couple own a bunch of other properties in the area. Do you have any information on that or? Um, I don't have the exact information right here in front of me. I do remember uh, taking three different properties on Rowcroft Avenue that they own to court and getting three-year injunctions on them. Um, I know Did, that they, were you successful? Oh, yes. Oh, so you went to environmental court and they got three years? Yes. Okay. Um, I know we've received some complaints since then. It's been a while since I think I've seen one come in that they continued operating. However, I haven't been able to find any proof of that. Um, part of the advertisements that we had found were on their own personal website, which has been made private. And out of the uh, who's compliance particular web of collecting data, unless you tell them, I guess? Um, I, I haven't uh, checked on these ones recently. Or we're not giving away all our secrets, I guess, is what you're saying. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Osborne? Okay, thank you. So, um, Getting back to this property that we're talking about today, um, like you said, you haven't seen it rented in a couple of months, but you, you say it's part of this same kind of ownership group that we heard of. And mm -hmm. so that being said, I'll ask you again, why are you here and why, why what, do you, what do you want to tell us? We wish Jerry no ill will, but we, we do not think that that property should be continued to be given a short-term rental permit. Yep. So. In the, in the nature of them not being, doing it the right way and continuing to go against them having the permits, we, I just don't feel like they need to have another short-term rental. Our neighborhood doesn't need it, and particularly in this case. Okay. Questions for the opposition? Okay. Thank you for being here. Thank you. We'll hear from the applicant again, and this is rebuttal time. He gets to respond to what he heard and um, offer anything new. So yes. let's start off. You, did you have a couple houses that went to environmental court? We did. We did. Why was that? So there, there was issues with uh, properties not being permitted. That you owned? That, that we owned jointly. One was 762 Roycroft, mm -hmm. um, where we had applied for the permit. We had been awaiting a fire inspection, and we dropped the ball. So the permit was applied for. We had gone ahead and uh, been awaiting the, the, the fire marshal, and we just went ahead and started renting it. Um, we accepted fault for that. We did not realize the seriousness of the penalty. We got a three-year ban on that and two other properties. Um, and at that point, that's, that's where we reformed, honestly. We said, hey, look, we can't do this anymore, and that's why I'm here. Um, now, the other properties that, that they're referring to, I'm, I'm appalled to hear that, and I mean, I will definitely extend my phone number. I, I don't want any any short-term or long-term tenants of mine to cause trouble for anybody in our in our neighborhood. So, what about booking? It sounds like you were advertising definitely over the required number, but they have proof. It seems like they notice large numbers of people. How did that happen? Yep. So, um, in Airbnb, the moment we were told we can't advertise further, we lowered it to 12. But as you identified, sometimes people just put the number in and then they bring other people. Um, actually, a, a neighbor. Uh, who I spoke to for this particular property, Richard DeMumriam, also expressed concern about the same issue. And I told him I would install cameras in order to help uh, alleviate that. And so uh, I have cameras up in that property now. And I told him whether it's short-term rented or long-term rented. So that would be my proposed remedy for that. And I've, I'm happy to share my phone number, direct contact information with any neighbor who has these concerns. I don't want anybody associated with any of my properties going into that. And, and just to address also, we, Autumn and I did work together in the past. We were married. Now, now that relationship is dissolved, both business and personal. So there is no. So all the properties are either in her name or your name? Except for one, which at the time of the divorce, we had an offer on and the offer fell through. So we have one more joint property. It's a long-term rental. But it's on the market. It's on the market. Just it's so. not on the market. It's, uh, it's, it's a joint rental that we have to, she wants to buy from me, I want to buy from her, and we're trying to sort that out. Okay, but you, it'll be in one person's hands. Well, That's tell right. Them, 
Well, one of the things that I thought was very troubling is Mr. Osborne um, alluded to and the neighbors alluded to that you list on all sorts of other sites, including some non-Airbnb sites, and you ask people to contact you so they don't have to go through Airbnb. Yeah, so um, we, did ha we do have a website that was up, and when we initially uh, were brought to environmental court, we were told that that was a marketplace. We had seen the original definition, and we, we had Jamie Holland as our attorney. He came before environmental court and argued that that website was not a marketplace, and there were briefs submitted. There was all kinds of legal stuff done, but ultimately, we got a three-year ban, and what we were told was, hey, if you need to go through Airbnb, and you need to go through that. Now, in the process of which, we do have listings in which if somebody does not have um, if, if they, we don't have availability at that home or if it's not a right fit, we do ask and say, hey, we've got, at the time we had multiple permits. I also lost a non-owner occupied due to the divorce, 725 Benton, that was pulled back. Um, I was advised not to appeal that, that that wasn't coming back no matter what. So I, I let that go. So at the time, and this may be during those particular instances where we were permitted for that property in September, that, that these occurred, or if it occurred more recently, um, it may be during um, a group that I had. I have a person that I exchange stays with in Chattanooga, um, and they bring groups of people up from time to time, and that's not a paid stay. I just exchange, uh, exchange uh, a stay in Chattanooga for a stay here. So I don't know, bottom line is I don't know what occurred there. We do have a history in terms of going to environmental court, but we haven't had any violations since, neither her nor I. Okay, questions for the applicant? Was this particular uh, 754 Benton Avenue jointly held by you and your wife? It was our personal home. And how, so was, the, was it held tenants by the entirety? Do you know? I don't. I don't have the title in front of me. It may have been tenants in common, but I, I believe it was tenants in entirety. I'm, I'm not as exactly sure. Okay. But it and was marital property as, as it was purchased during our marriage, So and it was renovated during our marriage. It and, wasn't separate property. And now the deed is solely in your name. The deed is solely in, in my name per the divorce agreements. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. We're going to close public hearing discussion. I have a question. We've, and we've talked about this a lot. I mean, this is somewhat different to me than a change in ownership where you transfer the property to another entity where you have it by a marriage, you know, his, his ownership didn't change. I realize the number of owners changed, but we still have the same owner. How is Metro looking at that? So I'll bifurcate the question a little bit and talk about the scenario. The marital scenario in particular, I think, is, is important here. In the instance of either marriage or divorce, we try to work with people a little bit and say, yeah, of course, it's a technical change in ownership if it goes from Mr. and Mrs. to just Mr. Um, you've had a tough enough year. We're not looking to kick your permit also. It was the fact that we had two changes in the ownership structure in that same year for a relatively short period of time that made this a little bit different. The black letter law, neither at the local level nor the state level, gives an overt exemption for the ownership change just because of marriage or divorce, which is probably just an oversight, not a huge big deal. We have chosen to interpret the law to say in the event of marriage or divorce, the addition or subtraction of one spouse or is not something where we normally would have somebody. Too, if you Presumably spouse, in, in a death scenario a also. Chance. Yeah. And subsequent ownership change, a change of ownership structure because of that. Again, this one, because there were two changes in a short period of time, were a bit different and merited, we thought, a review by the BZA, and that's part of how it got here. And my compliments to the board for not going too far down the road of prior environmental court actions, a very important thing, but nevertheless, not what's before the board today. My compliments to the neighbors who spoke today, who doubtless have lots of concerns based upon those prior actions and, and environmental court affairs, but I thought communicated their concerns in a very fair and balanced way. And my compliments to Mr. Andretti for the way he presented his case, acknowledging, taking responsibility. All that's before you today is a question of should codes have revoked that permit or not based upon these ownership changes. Normally we would not have if we saw divorce, one subsequent change, uh, and I think that addresses your question most directly. Here because there were two, it was different, we couldn't tell for sure what was going on, it seemed appropriate to review at the board level. And 
<coughs> initially it went from Autumn Andrade, it was quick claim to Autumn and Gerald Andrade. That was in, I believe, February of 2018. So it was, it was, it was I don't know husband, when the divorce was. Husband to husband and wife. It went from wife to husband and wife, and then from husband and wife to husband. Okay. Um, I don't, he just said that the initial, it was there um, where they lived. So initially, she got the permit in 2015. I'm not sure when they got married, when they got divorced, but I know that she got, she got the permit. Ownership was then transferred to her and her husband um, after they were married. And then, I don't know if that was pre-divorce or post-divorce, but the second change in ownership apparently came after the divorce to only husband. And to the question of the divorce decree, I believe the testimony was that was February of 2018 when the divorce decree was in place. So if that helps with the timeline. So I can't tell what happened. All we've got is the, just the actual decree, not the MDA. Mr. Osborne, what do you have in your hands? So I have the three deeds, most recent deeds on the property assessor site, if you all like to look at those to try and make sense of it. Okay. So basically the first one shows that it was Autumn Andretti's, and then the second one shows they went from Autumn Andretti unmarried and Gerald Andretti unmarried to them again unmarried, and then the last one shows it being uh, quick claim to Gerald Andretti un unmarried. So I think that's why the revocation was triggered is because it went from them unmarried to them unmarried for whatever reason. Three quick claim deeds here. The most recent is 9-26-2018 by Karen Johnson, former BZA member. On council the, person. Yes, council person now. Now, of course, register of deeds. So that's the most recent changing ownership there, and then one from February 2018, and then one from March 2013. What do you guys think? Well, if we just uphold the zoning administrator, then they can't reapply for a year, right? And, I, and it, that doesn't seem fair to me because of uh, the change of ownership is. If I could answer that briefly, if y'all uphold the administrator, um, the cancellation revocation would remain in effect. They. Um, I believe because they have not operated since it was revoked, they could reapply, but they would reapply under the current law because state law says you apply, your, the law in effect at the time the permit was obtained governs unless a change of ownership. So you're, what's before you today, if you uphold the zoning administrator, the revocation would stay in place, or the revocation would stay in place, they could reapply, but because they are, um, I don't know if it's owner-occupied or not owner-occupied, but that would depend on the zoning, you know, what, what they're applying for, whether or not they're eligible. If you overturn the zoning administrator because of the divorce, then the permit would be reinstated. So, but if, the, if we upheld the zoning administrator, are you saying that when they reapply, they may not get the permit because of the It depends on, it, that's right, it depends on what kind of uh, 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 permit they apply for. If they would apply under the current law, and this is zoned, I believe, R6 or R8, and so owner-occupied is allowed in R8 zoning, but non-owner-occupied is not allowed, so it would depend on what kind of permit he plans to apply for. Okay, so because in some of these cases, we know for sure that if we uphold the zoning administrator and the person reapplies whenever there's 
there's no law that's going to keep them from having the same status in terms of a short-term rental. And what you're saying is that may not necessarily be the case in this case. That's right. If he applies for non-owner-occupied, he would not be eligible based on the zoning. If he comes in and applies for owner-occupied, he would be eligible. But again, he would fall under the current law, not the law in 2015, which was when the permit was originally obtained. Okay. Anyone have a motion? Do you? What do you think? This one's a little different. It is different. Which is why I think it's in front of us, because as John Michael mentioned, that administratively, if it was just the divorce and this one right. house, they would have just easily just said, okay, here. And I think a good point was made that this is also different because if you do, if you own it as, if you're a joint owner and then it goes to this, you being the single owner, is that really a change of ownership? And I, I will tell I, I can't imagine that the legislature would not, if they would have, right. that's kind of a un, somewhat unusual circumstance. And I think that if they would have thought that through, they would have not intended to make that change in ownership when you really remain an owner and then all of a sudden your permit's revoked and then you may, your property rights may be negatively affected because of that. And I, that just, it, I think it's a, it's a, it's an unusual and kind of tough case to think through for me. Councilman Sledge um, sent us a letter and he says, I am neutral on it as it was triggered by unique circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's somewhat unusual to hear too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I agree with you. So I think we could say that the zoning administrator erred on the basis that he did maintain an interest in the, the in a sense, the property ownership did not change even though the deeds changed. And, and there, the, the other cases we've had before us have been where it has been, for example, transferred from an individual to a trust. Right, right. Not to an individual, back to the trust and the individual. Mm -hmm. So... Is that a motion? It can be. I'll second. I just want to say okay, well, to what okay. you're Motion's saying. been made and seconded. Oh, we'll sorry, discuss. Mm -hmm. No, but discussion. But in this case, it was owned by the wife, and after they divorced, they were unmarried, and they, well, let's say they were unmarried as tenants in common in February of 2018. Because they held the property jointly still, or some of it. So that's why they did it that way. Okay, so they... Because remember that last piece that he said, they still have common ownership and they're just trying to figure out who's going to buy each other out. That's not this piece. That's a different piece. No, that's piece. a different piece. But, you know, during the marriage, it seems like there was... Okay. A lot of... All right. Um, I'm, that's my discussion. I'm good. Okay, but you heard his motion mm -hmm. on that. Okay. Thank you. More discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Those passes. Good luck. Okay, that concludes the BZA. We'll see you next month. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.